Well, guys, it's an absolute pleasure on a cold, wet, miserable night here in Adelaide. I'm talking to Melbourne's finest band, Elm Street, that I basically loved since 2013 when they played with Ice Earth. And I'm talking to the lead singer, Ben. Good evening, Ben, and thanks for joining us. No, how's it going, guys? Thanks for uh, getting me on board in the kind words. It's, uh, it's my pleasure. Yeah, we've got a lot of things to talk about. You've got a new album that's been released. I know some fans around Australia, especially here in Adelaide, are still concerned that the album's not yet in the stores at JB High Five. And we'll, mm. we'll go into that in a little bit um, as we speak. But um, I want to go back to the start, how I basically came about listening to you guys. Firstly, I bought a ticket back in 2013 for Megadeth because they were supposed to be doing a sideshow in 2014. Okay. Downwave. And they pulled out. I got a uh, phone call from a mate in Melbourne saying, Megadeth, they pulled out. How about coming to see Ice Earth? So I used all the money I got back from that ticket to purchase a meet and greet with Ice Earth, and lo and behold, you guys were playing. Now, awesome. Now, the funny thing about it is you guys started... Um, when the meeting group was still taking place because due mm. to the Formula One Grand Prix was running around in Melbourne and the band arrived there late and had to do their sound check. Well, I walked out at the venue, um, the meeting group thing and one minute the music was playing, the next minute it stopped. Well, my partner, who was a photographer, was down the front and apparently Aaron, the guitarist, tripped over his cord and basically... <laughs> dislocated his kneecap. That's it. <laughs> I want to ask, that's not the first time he's done that, and secondly, why haven't you guys endorsed into getting cordless microphones? Um, not guitar, guitar things. Yeah, no, it's, it's a bit of a funny one, and it's, it's funny you mention that, because earlier that year, I had dislocated my kneecap for the second time in my life. So I did it when I was a young kid, my left knee. Yeah. And uh, earlier that year, I did it to my right knee. And I had just just before the Ice Earth Tour, I just uh, recovered from that injury. Yeah. So that was a bit of a funny one. I didn't do it on stage. I did it through a sporting injury, but it was pretty funny. And, I mean, it was just a, a turn of events. It, it's... You know, it's a shame because we did, before that we had done uh, 35 shows, I think it was in total, with Ice Earth across Europe, uh, and we supported them uh, throughout the whole European tour, which was amazing. You know, ourselves, we're big Ice Earth fans, so it was an absolute honour for us. And then we, you know, came to the glory of, all right, well, we supported them in Europe. Let's do a tour with them in Australia. And we supported them across Australia. And uh, Brisbane and Sydney were awesome shows. We gained a lot of fans. And, um, you know, everything ran perfect. John Schaefer had celebrated his birthday the previous night. Uh, I think it was a Saturday night in Sydney. So that was an awesome show. And finally, we came to Melbourne and we thought, okay, well, we did 35 shows around Europe. We did this Australian tour when we ended it in our hometown, Melbourne. So on, on paper, it sounds amazing. Yeah. You know, it's awesome. It's it's like a homecoming show for us and we're the only support. So, yeah, we, we kicked in three songs. Aaron was on the floor and there you go with the dislocated knee. So it was a, it was a, a bit of a bad luck show. Yeah. Um, at, at that time, we were using uh, these metal cords, which were, uh, you know, sort of sending the signals from the amps to the instruments a bit better than what cordless uh, wireless microphones did do at that time. Mm. Uh, you know, obviously, they've, they've released newer models, which sort of you get the same sort of signal, but we're always on the old school way of, right, let's just plug in. Yeah. Now we've sort of learned and we, we, we've just started using those uh there's wireless cords, so uh, definitely a lesson learned. Yeah, it was it was a um, a, sh a moment that it, in my mind forever, and it was it, it shouldn't have happened. But at, the good thing about it is, Aaron wanted you guys to continue on to play, and that's it. <laughs> yeah, he did. And every time I meet Aaron, when you guys play. I always joke about that incident with Ice Surf when he fell over and dislocated his kneecap. Now he doesn't wear um, slip-on shoes like 
he's got grip on his on his feet now. So that's uh, right. Hopefully no, he doesn't do any more. But um, man, what a night it was! I also seen you open up with Accept and Tank Card and all those things. You you guys been going on the rise and rise and rise. Then. When I got back from the ISS, I had an interview with Ken Kelly. Now, a lot of people didn't know about this, that Ken Kelly was in the process of doing the artwork for the upcoming latest album, Knock Em Out, with a metal fist. But that hasn't been mentioned by the band, hasn't, hasn't been mentioned by anyone. But Ken Kelly did say this to me off air, that he was working with Elm Street. And now, here we are, new album. Artwork's mm. been released, and Ken Kelly, who worked with Kiss and Manowar, just to name a few, is now working with one of the Australian finest bands, Elm Street. How did that come about, and how, who made a contact to Ken Kelly, or vice versa? Yeah, well, basically, uh, we had released our first album, Barbed Wire Metal, back in 2011. And uh, everything we do, we wanted to give quality. You know, we don't want to just release music and make people buy products and, you know, just throw it, uh, you know, in their CD stash and just forget about it. We want to make an impact with everything we do, not only with the music but the live shows. And um, for us, visual is something that's always been very important. You know, you want a product that is visually uh, stimulating to your eyes and just like the 80s, you know, you used to go to the record store and you used to say, okay, well, I'm going to buy this CD because it looks cool. You know, not because you knew all of the band's name or not because you knew all the band's music. It's because it actually looked cool. So we know a lot of bands don't invest that much into artwork nowadays and sort of go through the cheaper process because, you know, at the end of the day, digital music is where you make the most money. Uh, live, live shows is where you make some money as well. But so with our first album, we thought, all right, we're going to come in with a bank. We're going to say we're Elm Street and uh, this is the sort of music that we played. So we hired uh, Ed Repka, who had worked with uh, bands like Megadeth or Violence, some, some of the 80s thrash bands, you know, he did Rust and Peace, he did the Peace Sales front cover. So that was cool. But in terms of thrash, that was the top of the food chain. You know, you couldn't work with anybody more iconic than Ed Repka. So obviously with the second album, we wanted to raise the bar again because we wanted to improve on every single product that we did. And by raising the bar, we're like, well, shit, we raised it a bit too high, you know, for the first album. What do we do? Where do we move from then? And uh, I guess in the heavy metal and in canvas paintings, in epic artwork, you, you cannot get bigger than Ken Kelly. You know, the guy did Love Gun and Destroyer. You, you just can't get bigger than that. Mm. And he's done basically all of Man of War's album covers since Fight in the World. So, um, we, you know, I, I myself just sent him an email, just said, look, we're massive fans of your work. Um uh, this is a little bit about us. This is what we want to achieve with the next album. This is the vision that we have for this album. This is the sort of themes that we're following. And he was pretty quick to respond. And by the time you knew it, he had a concept together uh, with all the details that we gave him. We discussed it a little bit, went back and forth with some uh, ideas here and there. And uh, now we've ended up with an amazing artwork piece. Yeah. And not only that, I just want to ask, with the EP that came out around the Hammerfall gig last year as well. Was mm. that Ken Kelly's artwork on the EP as well? No, that one was actually done by another awesome artist uh, in Mexico, believe it or not, and his name is Dark Prince Graphics. Mm. And uh, it's more of, more of digital work, and uh, we sort of wanted to release something that was uh, very 80s influenced again. Yep. And uh, he came out with that piece, and it's uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. I, I quite enjoyed that one as well. Yeah, it, it fantastic and man you guys have been going on the rise ever since i've seen you but not only that since you've started back in 2003 and you've taken the worldwide stages by storm after you um you sign up with your de debut barbed wire metal and that uh, and not only that you've done a lot of hard work you've done a lot of dedication from a fan's perspective talking to you how much does that ingredients need to be in place when you start out a band because a lot of people nowadays want to go on talent shows like the X Factor mm. and Australian Got Talent and that. but let's take that away for a second how much 
of those two core ingredients, hard work and dedication, need to be in place for world domination, so to speak, because you guys came from the back streets of Melbourne, you've gone overseas plenty of times over, you've also toured with great bands like Accept, Tankard, Hammerforth, Isis, just to name a few. <clears throat> so, back to the question, why is it that so important to have the hard work and dedication? Well, I think it's a necessity. You know, it's sort of uh, if you want to become a chef, but you don't know, you know, how to deal with food, or you don't know how to chop an onion. You know what I mean? It's sort of the key ingredients that you need. Um, if you want to, I mean, even if you just want to start a local band and just play local gigs, you need to still uh, show that you, you know, you want to put in the hard yards. You want to put in the hard work. That you know, it takes hours to rehearse as a band, um, especially with ourselves. We started back in two thousand and three when we were at the age of fourteen, and nobody knew how to play an instrument. Literally nobody had picked a big guitar, nobody had sung on a microphone or hit a drum. Um, we just started the band because we loved heavy metal and we loved uh, live music. We loved watching the old Iron Maiden concert or, or the old Metallica concerts and whatnot. Uh, so that's how we started the band. Mm. And, and basically we said, okay, well, Tom... Do you want to play the drums? Like, yeah, cool. Well, I wouldn't mind playing guitar. Aaron, would you mind playing guitar? He's like, yeah, yeah, I'll learn guitar. So we all went away, uh, got ourselves music teachers, and we learned that way. So we showed, um, you know, the, the hard work throughout the years of it showing to improve and sort of listen out to that and learn how to write songs, which for us was hard work. You know, we would usually email uh, the bigger bands. You know, we used to t talk to sort of the uh, the iconic bands in Melbourne at the time, like Vanishing Point or even Dungeon back in those days. We used to email them and say, hey, guys, we're, we're 16 and we love your music. You know, we love to listen to it. Can you give us some tips on how to write lyrics? Because we don't even know where to start. Yeah. So we used to do that all the time. And, uh, you know, you have to be dedicated to the music. Mm. You know, we started when we were 14 and now we're at the ages of 26, 27, you know, leading into our 30s. And... You know, there's girlfriends that come and go, there's jobs that come and go, there's different priorities in your life. Uh, but as long as you've got that one goal on, you know, this is what I want to do, this is what I started when I was 14, I still want to be dedicated to this and see it through, uh, that's one of the main things. So I think, uh, you know, whether you want to tour the world, whether you just want to play in Melbourne, whether you want to start a cover band, you know, even if you want to do karaoke, you still have to show some sort of dedication and you still have to work hard to, you know, produce some quality music. Yeah. The good thing about it is, and I kind of laugh at this as well, when people on the outside say, don't give up your day job, most mm. of you guys have never given up a day job. I mean, if, if all else fails doing the music business, you still have your job to go back into. And many other bands around the world is like that as well. They haven't left their job or gave up the day job, they just mm. follow their dream. I kind of laugh at that too, because it's, it's realistic, because you don't give up a day job to be successful. That's right. You know, and what I also see here in Australia, I mean, we can um, disagree on this, but I think you'll agree with me, a lot of bands in Australia don't get the recognition they deserve, especially when it comes to commercial radio, especially Triple M, who is... Mm in my opinion, was the only hard rock metal radio station in Australia before Triple J came along. But when you've got um, an online support group with social media and that, they can stream your um, album or single just by a click of a button and then they go and listen, <coughs> buy it off iTunes, so forth, so forth. That is the, the digital world we live in at the <coughs> moment. Um, I don't focus on radios anymore, uh, well commercial radio anyway because I do my podcast like this and I play all the music without any boundaries, I don't care if it's got explicit material in it whatever, my job is to get the music out there to many years as possible, whether they like it or not that's their opinion but my job is to get it out there to many years as possible and hopefully they can go and purchase it that's awesome You know, let's get into the album Knock Em Out With A Metal Fist this has got so many elements, it's a magnificent recipe. You've got a bit of power metal element. I've heard, I'm hearing 
old school accept. I'm hearing a little bit of Ozzy Osbourne in there, blending with classic crashes, whatnot. This is an outstanding album. I, I want to ask, what type of approach did you go into with this album compared to your previous album, Barbed Wire, with Barbed Wire Metal? Because this is more, in my opinion, more fresher. You guys are more mature. And, man, this is just going to be probably one of the best albums of Australian metal for 2016. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Thanks for that, Jamie. It obviously means a lot, especially with all the hard work and, uh, you know, hours and efforts that went into that. But basically that's all that went into it. We never... Um we didn't go into the in, in, into the type of writing session where we were like, oh, well, you know, let, let's write this type of record or let's write these type of songs. We basically just let life evolve, just like barbed wire metal. You know, we started uh, writing that at the age of 16 and we just let the songs evolve. So, you know, after the release of that album, we toured the world. We went over to London and we lived in London for a year as a band and toured around Europe through that. Uh, like I said, we went through different jobs. Uh, you know, there was personal family things that went on and there was girlfriends that came and gone. There was hookups that come and go. And it, it, it was sort of that. So we said, you know what? In order to write a, an album from the heart and in order to, you know, mean what we're actually saying is send, and send across the message that people can relate to, we have to write about life experiences, mm. you know. We have, to, we have to make it personal. So everything on that album is something that has happened to us and something that we have been through. So uh, the music itself just evolved. We just wrote music that we love to play. You know, we didn't say, we, you know, we obviously listen to different types of styles of metal, whether it be thrash or AOR or glam metal or hard rock, uh, even so. Uh, and we just, you know, when it, basically someone would come up with a riff and then we'd just build on that and on the road, sometimes we were just having some down times that we'd just write up some music. Uh, and then we say, okay, well, you know, we're on tour. Uh, I'm sort of missing home now, so let's let's write a song about missing home. This sort of music sort of calls for that theme, and that's what we did. So, like you said, it's more of a mature album. It's a it's an album that I think once people get the themes, they can relate to, yeah. uh, and I think that's what made both the music and the vocals come out so genuine. Uh, and so natural because we actually believed in what we were saying opposed to, you know, not knocking our first album, Barbed Wire Metal, because we still love that sort of music, mm -hmm. but we weren't, we were no longer singing about horror characters or fictional characters or, um, you know, about heavy metal per se. We were sort of more saying, okay, well, this is what we're going to do. This is what we've been through. This is the hardships we've been through. And we know that out there people can relate to that. Yeah. Well, as I mentioned before, it's got a bit of um, Ozzy Osbourne element in it. The song, the first song off the album, will take it a lifetime. There's a bit of a guitar riff um, near the end, middle to the end. It sounds <clears throat> like um, Crazy Train, but in a different um, element. Because I, I can hear that. I mean, it might sound similar or whatnot, but hey, yes. I love it. Oh, I love it. <laughs> well, that's cool to hear, man. That's a, that, that's a cool song, and we we obviously dig a bit of Aussies. So, yeah, um, you know, definitely not, not trying to copy their style, but it's always cool to hear to hear people say, "Okay, well, that's your influences," and us saying, "Well, yeah, yeah, you know, we love Crazy Train." So, I guess it does seep out when yeah. you're writing some music. But most importantly, um, some of these songs uh, got that, like I said, the old school vibe with the older set, Man of War. Bit of Iron Maiden, Judith Priest, and a few others of the classic thrash thing as well. When it comes down to the um, Heart Racer EP, and it's also off the album too. When you played it live in the in the in the audience for um, the Hammerfall gig, I did look around in the audience, and I'm saying, man, these guys are, are capturing if because there will be some um, members in the audience who have never heard of, mm. of Elm Street before. But me being me, who I am, I not just focus on the band. I look what's around me and see how the crowd reacts to the songs. And I'm so thrilled with the newer songs, especially Heart Race, and I think Face the Reaper was played on the on the bill as well. Those yeah. two 
those two songs really did impact the, the Melbourne audience for the Hammerfall gig. Yeah, that's it. And, and it's, I think it shows, um, like I said, when, when a song has personal meanings to you and when, when you can relate to something, you know, it shows in your playing. Yeah. You know, I can't imagine uh, beating the drums so hard to a song that, you know, r- has no meaning to me and you have to play it for years. You know, in the end, it's almost like you're playing a cover song. Whereas yeah. when you can relate to that time that you uh, wrote that song or when you can relate to the theme that you wrote that about, then it starts to come out in your emotions. And that's why for us, it's easy to go out there and play these newer songs and, uh, you know, sort of uh, show, play them with conviction. Yeah, and playing with passion, and then that comes out with the crowd because people are like, mm, "Shit, yeah, that's uh, I'm feeling this too." Yeah. So then you feed off the crowd that way. So it's it's awesome that you felt that way, and it's also also cool for us to hear uh, that people are getting those themes. Yeah, well, I I looked around at the um, one so many ruffles that night, and just just seeing a look on people's face, I said, "Okay, they are capturing." That's just what they are. They are relaying a message to them. The the fans and the audience are responding, and it's, it just shows you that this was only an EP. It wasn't the album. And that's it. Can you imagine what it's going to be like once the album starts to get spread out in the right channels to people as well? But with um the, the second single, "Kiss the Canvas," I'm just a bit concerned about this. Why wasn't that called "Knock 'Em Out with a Metal Fist"? Because that's basically what is mentioned in the chorus, knock them out with a metal fist. So why did the song became Kiss the Canvas instead of knock them out with a metal fist? Uh, well, I've... We thought it was pretty cool not to have a song title on the album. You know, sort of band sort of did that back in the day. You know, the Black Album, there wasn't really a song called Black or anything on the Black Album or, you know, Destroyer, for example, Kiss. There was no song actually called Destroyer. So we sort of wanted to go back to those older themes and the entire theme for the album was Knock Em Out With A Metal Fist, you know, because that's what we are going to go out to the world with these newer shows and these new music is what we're going to do to the entire nation yeah. but um you know kiss the canvas itself is is uh, is also about you know that but it's actually a song about uh me you know i, I do boxing uh for a sport and uh one day after work i just couldn't be bothered going boxing and i went there and i sparred and i basically got knocked out so that's what that song is about yeah. um so uh, Kiss the Canvas is an old term that they use, it's still, to, still to this current day, but if you watch uh, old Muhammad Ali fights or even yep. going into Mike Tyson fights uh, when people would go knock, knock down or when fighters wanted to intimidate each other, they're like, you know, I'm going to make you kiss the canvas or, you know, commentators would say, oh, he's kissed the canvas. Yep. Um, so we thought that was a cool theme and it's thrown in there in the second verse and then, you know, well, when the chorus comes up people can relate it to the album and say oh cool and it's a bit of a theme yeah. uh, and it's a hell of a long title for that song as well so we're like shit will that even fit on YouTube um, and uh, yeah that, that's basically the story behind that and why we we decided not to to call it that because again uh, like barbed wire metal people could get the wrong idea of what sort of band we are um, yeah. So we wanted to sort of treat it more so on a serious basis. Going back on your um, dimension there about Muhammad Ali and Mike Tyson, who do you think will win the fight if, if back in their prime, so to speak? Oh, uh, I think totally different fighters. M- Mike Tyson was uh, just an extremely tough guy, you know, somebody that would intimidate you, whereas Muhammad Ali was exactly the same, but he was more skill. Do you know what I mean? Like very... Uh, he. he sort of draw you down and then when he was ready he'd, he'd kick your ass but Mike Tyson was just a mean guy I yeah. would not even touch that guy man I'd I'd be shitting myself so uh, I don't think the two could fight it would, it would break my heart yeah. <laughs> it couldn't happen yeah but I'm, I'm just saying Muhammad Ali didn't even look like a heavyweight boxer no, no, he didn't. But he was tall as hell. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I think back in those days as well, he was fighting guys that were sort of the same weight, 
Whereas yeah. as time went on, you know, the Mike Tyson eras, the guys were pumping the weights heavy, they were hitting the heavy bags, so there were more machines. Just just want to think, will his ears survive in a fight with Mike Tyson? <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> no one's ears are free with that guy. Yeah, I know. But, um, yeah, God bless um, Muhammad Ali. Died. Yeah, definitely. You know, he was a, he was a champion boxer. I mean... Whether people like what he did outside the ring, that's his, that's their choice. But inside the ring, he was a champion. Yeah, that's and, exactly right. I think there was another um, song. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's Sabbath or Next in Line. It has that slower Metallica feel, like nothing else matters in it. Mm. Yeah, that's uh, definitely Sabbath. Yeah, Sabbath. I looked at that and go, yep, Metallica. <laughs> You know, yeah, I, I can just go through every single song. It's like, like I mentioned before, will it take a lifetime? Ozzy Osbourne. Then I go down to Sabbath, Metallica. You guys are so impacted with your idols, and you just blend it in to make it your own. Yeah, that's it. I mean, uh, like I said, I guess it sort of comes out. I don't think at the time we wrote that middle section, uh, which is the cleaner part, like you mentioned, like nothing else matters. I don't think we we thought Metallica at the time was sort of uh, because the theme of that sort of calls for a clean section. You know, it's sort of the end of the verse and the end of the second chorus Mm. uh, leads into a part which involves death. And we sort of wanted to um, show that. And, you know, when we play live, we sort of feel that part, you know, we bring the volume down and we want to uh, ride that sort of clean section. But, uh, yeah, that, that, that's cool to hear. We definitely show our our influ- influence, like you said. We wear the colours on our sleeves and, um, you know, we're not ashamed to say we draw uh, influences from bands like Iron Maiden or, uh, you know, even bands like Hammerfall that we've played with or Iced Earth. We, we're influenced by life and we've grown up with those guys and we've toured with some of those bands, been lucky enough to do that. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we definitely do that. It, it definitely comes out. There's a couple of questions I've got to ask on the album as well. <clears throat> there are some people here in Adelaide and I think some fans around Australia. The album has already been released on the 24th of June. Now, for some reason, um, JB Hi-Fi hasn't got in the stores at, at the moment. We know it's not you guys' fault. It's a distributor for um, JB Hi-Fi. Do you know what's um, the go in that for some of the fans out there that may be listening? Yeah, well, I mean, it's a sad time, I think, for physical distribution of music. Um, it, it's happened to me with many items, you know, not from even smaller labels, from larger labels like Nuclear Blast or Roadrunner Records in the past. I think uh, for companies like JB, you know, as a band or even as a record label, you want to put a date on a release of something and, you know, these companies can no longer prioritise that and commit to that. It's yeah. almost like you have to set a fake release date for them and do it a week earlier. It's just, you know, they, they, they definitely received the music, I believe, JB Hi-Fi, the, the main warehouse. Uh, they just don't prioritise music music to be distributed anymore it's uh you know there's there's not that much money in it you know back in the day people used to look forward to going to jb and buy uh the new releases or go out of their way whereas nowadays it's like well i might listen to it on spotify or youtube first or i might purchase it on itunes and if i love it enough then uh, i'll go buy the physical album and then you can see oh well the band's coming through town uh in the next couple of weeks i'll just wait until then to get it so it's a bit tough uh it's unfortunate as well for the fans that did pre-order it um and something that we didn't know that would happen uh but I, I can assure that when they do get it, like you, they'll enjoy the album and hopefully they'll enjoy the physical product as well because there was some time and efforts uh, spent on making it look cool. Yeah. Well, I remember back in the 90s, every, I think the new releases came out on a Thursday and I was at the record stores every Thursday and I'd check out the new releases and I will go and buy it. And this was way before the digital world took over, before the internet. That's it. Every That's Thursday. That's it. Yeah. I think yeah. I think I think in Australia we had the new release on a Thursday. Over in America it's a Tuesday. 
Yeah, and, and, and there were cool times. I mean, I remember when I was, obviously I might be a bit younger than yourself, but, uh, you know, I used to, every Saturday I used to, my, my parents used to take me to the local sanity, you know, and I used to be able to go in the, the tape box there and, uh, you know, there was used to be the new release tapes for $10. Yeah. And I used to pick it out and I remember I still got them at home. I believe I got uh, Metallica's Load. Uh, I've got like an old Stay Hungry Twisted Sister tape and, you know, it's just, it, it was cool. It was, a, it was a cool time for music and times where, you know, people would put, like I said, efforts into the physical distribution or the physical appearance of albums yeah. uh, and used to look forward to flicking through and seeing the thank you notes or looking through and seeing, oh, what photos are going to come up because you couldn't Google an image and come up with a million sort of images of the band. You sort of wanted to see, oh, how they dressed on this album, you know? <laughs> exactly. But it's, um, it's unfortunate, but I guess you just have to go with the times. Yeah, sometimes you've got to be patient, I suppose. <laughs> That's it. But, um, yeah, going back to what I was saying, yeah, I think every Thursday we used to go in, in the 90s, go into the record store, to check out the new releases. I mean, back in those days, you can buy singles in the CDs. Now you can't. You've got to go on. Um, That's it. You know, that's YouTube, exa- and not, not. that's exactly right. But and, the good thing yeah. about the good thing about Elm Street is that over the course of a couple of weeks, that Knock 'Em Out with a Metal Fist has been released. You are number five on the iTunes charts. Yeah, yeah, and that was uh, that was overwhelming. <laughs> you know, you, ne- you never think you're going to make any charts, and uh, it's it's tough for an Australian band to get on those charts because we don't have as much push and pull as overseas bands do. Um, so it was cool to see that you know that it meant that on the first day of release for that album we had enough sales more than, you know, some some of the, you know, more mainstream bands like Parkway Drive on that day. Mm. So, um, yeah, it was definitely a big achievement. I think the biggest achievement that we've achieved so far in terms of sales or uh, record releases. And the good thing is that it gives us confidence uh, and it motivates us to push our music and to push the appearance of the album and the uh the hype of the album even more when we release some new music. Mm. So that was, uh, yeah, definitely really cool. Yeah. Well, a couple of questions left before we wrap it up because we've been of going on for half, a, half an hour now. Uh, when you do go, well, when you go overseas, where if a support act or off the back of an EP or an album, what do you see the difference between going overseas in Australia in the terms of the, not the reaction from the fans, but the music itself? like the support of the music? Mm, I think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very similar. It's, it's very similar. The people, I think Australia is really underestimated, uh, especially nowadays, and the biggest cities, you know, like Melbourne or Sydney, um, people have perception that overseas is better than Australia. But we have been to some places overseas and, you know, Melbourne shits all over those places, you know what I mean? So um, I think just over there you have more of a broader audience that you will reach. You know, you don't only reach metalheads or um, you can go into, for example, Germany and you don't just play five five different cities. You can play, you know, 10 or 15 different cities in one place. So I think it's more uh, accessible to reach different audiences and it's uh, – it, you know, tours can last a lot longer. But um, in terms of support, I think especially in heavy metal, it's 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 quite the same all around the world because people have the same passion. Uh, they, they share the same love in music, whether you're in Australia or whether you're in Turkey. You sort of love it exactly the same. But with that being said, there are places like... Um, Poland, for example, that we've been to, where the fans are just crazy, even if they don't know you, just because they don't give a shit, and the, you know, their their background has been going through some hard times, so they sort of show that aggression out in the crowd, but they're loving at the same time. Yeah. Um, but I mean, we love playing all around the world, and uh, we always call Australia home, though. Yeah, that's the main thing. A lot of people forget what home is at the moment. That's it. And I know you're a massive footy fan and whatnot. I'm a Collingwood supporter. You're a Western Bulldog supporter. That's right. And that. And good win on the weekend from both clubs as well, even though we should have 
played a bit more style. You guys done the, the prequel from last year against the Sydney Swans. That's it, that's it. And that, But how do you think you guys will go leading into the finals? Uh, I don't get my hopes up anymore, man. It's like I've been following the doggies since I was young and we've never reached a grand final. And I've just, uh, you know, I remember back in 2000, I think, 11, we won the NAB Cup yeah. uh, against St Kilda back when we had Barry Hall and Ackermanis and Johnson and those sort of guys. And, uh, look... I've never seen a NAB Cup so full of doggy supporters and so packed after we won it when they did the trophy handover because supporters were just like hanging for some sort of, you know, cup for us to win. So I think we'll do well. I don't think we'll reach even the prelims uh, because of consistency or because of the young guys and, you know, playing on the bigger fields, we sort of don't do well because we don't get much games at the G. Yeah. You know, which is a bit sad. Um, but I think in the next few years, we could end up being contenders for that flag. Yeah. The reason why I ask, um, you guys should open up for the the entertainment for the grand final. I mean, they haven't that really had... Cool. They really haven't had much of Australian artists on the, on the thing. I mean, every time when they do, it's either the hunters and collectors recycled over or... They'll get John Farnham or someone like that, but they need rock, they need metal at the MCG, especially when it's a hundred thousand people at the grand final. That's it. I'd be absolutely shitting myself, but I think that would be cool. I'm actually thinking of uh, sending, you know, "Kiss the Canvas" the, the song to some uh, local boxers or even, you know, up to the UFC and say, "Well, look, this is what this song's about. It's actually, you know, it can get the pump crowd, uh, the, the crowd pumping." So yep. you just never know. Well, I can see, I can see it now. Before we wrap it up, I can see it now. Having you guys desecrate us, King Parrot, and probably Harlot or someone like that, even in yeah, Mouse's yeah. wake, just doing a whole forty-five minute set of songs of metal, and just do a wall of death before the the guys come out in the banners, just do a massive wall of death like Matt Young does from King Parrot. He, he's a he's a nutter, but I love him so much. He's a real nut. He's a real nut. So, um, just lastly, what's the plan for 2016? Are there any plans to come to Adelaide? I know you've just recently done a gig in Melbourne on this past Saturday, or Friday, I should say, with the album being released and whatnot, and you've yeah. got some others coming up. So what's the plan with um, more touring, like for Perth and Adelaide? Yeah, so we're uh, yeah we're wrapping up the whole year just with gigs, just in support of the album, you know, trying to get it out uh, as much as we can and sort of show people this is the sort of music that we play. So we've got a few interstate gigs booked up all the way up until November. Um, nothing with places like Perth or Adelaide confirmed just as yet, but we'll definitely come there, whether it be uh, this year or early next year, we'll definitely come there in support of the album. Uh, we'll be in South America in January, uh, supporting an old 80s band, Grim Reaper, from the UK. So, yeah, we're definitely going to be ending off the year with a lot of Australian shows. So it should be cool. So keep an eye out for us. We'll definitely be in Adelaide. Yep. All right, guys, there you have it. Thanks, Ben. And fans, go to their website, go to their social media sites, where it's Twitter, Facebook, Whatever. There's a link on... I know there's a link on their Facebook page where you can actually pre-order this album, whether you want to do it for JB Hi-Fi or whatnot. There is a pre-order. Also, if you go to their um, concert dates, they should have some physical copies there at the merch desk. Go and grab yourself one at the gigs where they'll be playing. Otherwise, be patient. JB Hi-Fi should have it very shortly. Yeah, definitely. I've heard that they've started sending them out as of today. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, if you order your copy, you should get it by the end of the week. No worries. Awesome. Thank you, Ben, and I cannot wait to see you guys back in Melbourne when I come over again very shortly. I'm coming over through Brutality, so hopefully there's a gig around there. Ah, awesome, definitely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thanks again for the support. Thanks, everybody, for listening. You know, keep supporting this local podcast. It's um, it's very interesting, and you, in, you interview some interesting people. So uh, thanks again for the support. No worries, and take care, man, and we we'll look forward to catching up very shortly. Yeah, definitely. All right, buddy. Have a good one. You too. Take care. All right, Bye. see ya.